Hello again, everyone. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. I am coming to you from, of course, Washington's nicest indoor shooting facility, that being Security Gun Club, right here in Woodenville, Washington. Listen, we have talked about the Bruin case, and then, of course, we have talked about the phenomena that occurred right afterwards, which is the post-Bruin tantrum. Now, we've seen that bear itself out in many, many state legislatures, and that has given us a ton of material to cover here on the channel. But now we're beginning to see this cancer spread and into a very dangerous area, and that is into academia. And it's not in where you traditionally might think in the undergrad college campuses. No, now it is actually seeping into those who are tasked with educating the next generation of lawyers. Don't believe me? I'll prove it to you. So today, let's spend a few minutes and talk about when law schools start teaching how to eviscerate your Second Amendment rights. Okay, so the issue we're talking about is an excerpt from an upcoming law review journal authored by one associate professor and one assistant professor at two well-known law schools. We will get to them in a moment. Now, for those of you who did not suffer the misery of going through law school, one of the tasks of many of the professors, especially those who are associate or assistant professors who want to become tenured professors, is to get published in law review journals. Every law school has at least one law review. Many um, law schools, the more prestigious ones, will have multiple law review journals, which of course will cover various aspects of the law. Now, what we have here is an excerpt, essentially kind of a sneak peek of a journal that is coming out by these two associate professors. The first professor is Assistant Professor Peter N. Salib of the University of Houston Law Center. So understand Professor Salib is in fact an assistant professor, and so you're gonna oftentimes get a lot more publishing out of them. Now, the co-author of this article is Guha Krishnamurthy of the University of Oklahoma College of Law. So these two individuals are tasked with writing a law review article, and the topic of that is qualified immunity as gun control. And you sit there and you say, well, what is qualified immunity? Well, we're gonna geek out for a minute here. Here it is in really simple English, hopefully easy to understand terms. Qualified immunity is, is that a government official is oftentimes immune from civil liability if they violate a person's constitutional rights, if they were acting in good faith, or unless there was some obvious and clear precedent that would have put that public official on notice that, hey, you can't do that. So it can allow for what ultimately turns out to be very significant violations of constitutional rights to still result in no civil liability upon the government official. Now, what these two brainiacs are suggesting is, is in the post-Bruin era, that we are just gonna have a hard, hard time figuring out how to get guns from people. And so what these law professors, and let me remind you that, that these law professors are now preaching in this law review article is to go out and blatantly and willfully violate individuals' constitutional rights and then just hope that qualified immunity saves the day. Don't believe me? Here's what the excerpt reads. The Supreme Court's ruling in Bruin threw the political project of gun regulation into question. Before Bruin, states could enact new kinds of gun restrictions if they passed a relatively stringent means and test. That is, if laws meaningfully reduced danger while not too heavily burdening the right of self-defense, they were allowed. After Bruin, only gun controls actually in force in the founding era and their close analogs are permissible. Many fewer regulations will now pass the constitutional test. And the only thing that I would agree with in that first paragraph is the last sentence, which yes, it did make these types of laws more difficult to pass. Now to suggest that it was a stringent means end analysis, one that all oh, these laws were just run through. Ask yourself this question, how many laws were ever thrown out under that stringent exam? But you see, then this article gets way, way worse because this is how it continues. Here, 
we suggest an unlikely source of continuing power after Bruin for states to disarm individuals they deem dangerous, qualified immunity. Qualified immunity shields state officers from monetary liability for many constitutional violations. In short, unless a previous case, quote, clearly established with high factual particularity that the officer's conduct was unconstitutional, the officer does not pay. Thus, a state law enforcement officer may, after Bruin, confiscate an individual's firearm if the officer deems that person too dangerous to possess it. The officer's justification may conflict with the federal court's understanding of Bruin or the Second Amendment, perhaps flagrantly. But unless a previous authoritative legal decision examining near identical facts says so, the officer risks no liability. And because each individual act of disarmament will be unique, such prior decisions will be vanishingly rare. The result is a surprisingly free hand for states to determine who should and who should not be armed, even in contravention of the Supreme Court's dictates. And we will actually post a verbatim quote of that down in the description box. So yes, these two assistant law professors, one from the University of Houston, one from Oklahoma University, are advocating in a law review article that government officials who should always have the ability to deem who should be armed and who should not, should just go out and confiscate weapons, even if it is in flagrant violation of the law and the constitution, and then just hope that qualified immunity covers them. This, my friends, is the type of stuff that is being used to educate the next generation of lawyers in this country. And let us not forget that this is not an isolated incident. Moms Demand Action, Giffords have both run around to law schools, making law students pledge that whatever they do, once they get out of law school, they will not work for anybody who represents gun rights. So not only do we have a complete legal and constitutional war under, underway here, we also have a cultural war which is now spilled into higher academia. This, my friends, is one of the many, many ways that this group intends on achieving civilian disarmament. We'll put links down below for all the information so you can verify the sources yourself. If you have any questions about this or anything else in the future, you should know how to contact Washington Gun Law by now. But if you don't, that's okay. That information is down there in the description box. In the meantime, let's all remember that part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.